Sure. All right, next email then. Father, this viewer says, First, I want to say that I am gladdened that Father Jenkins believes that Nova Sordo Catholics are still Catholics. But then I am left wondering why I shouldn't continue receiving the Eucharist at the daily Nova Sordo Mass. Yes. Also, a very dear relative of mine will be ordained soon. Do I not receive? I do find the whole situation very difficult. Father Jenkins, your words of truth and wisdom are greatly appreciated. Thank you, and God bless you. Well, God bless you, too. And thank you. When you say that I, I recognize that Novus Ero Catholics are Catholics, I have to be very careful about this. There are many of them who still hold the Catholic faith. We see them. They find their way back to the traditional faith and out of the Novus Ordo. And in a case like that, we find very often that their faith has survived the Novus Ordo, sometimes years, decades in the Novus Ordo. It's a miracle, grace. But... So they still have the Catholic faith, but they haven't been practicing the Catholic faith. They've been mistakenly practicing a false religion. And the false religion is the religion of modernism. It's the practice of modernism. That's what the Novus Ordo, that's what the New Order is. So those who are actually going to the, to the Novus Ordo parishes, the New Order parishes, uh, are actually practicing a religion that is contrary to, to what they actually believe, if they still have the Catholic faith. And that's why people find that there's a contradiction between what they believe and, between, and what they do, and what they see others do in the Novus Ordo. And finally, that contradiction um, forbids them to simply ignore that and continue, simply to ignore that and continue. Many do, and so they have to abandon the faith in order to uh, practice, get, do away with the tension between what they believe and what they practice in the Novus Ordo. Something has to give. They either have to abandon their faith and embrace the Novus Ordo, or they have to hold to the faith and abandon the Novus Ordo and reject it. <clears throat> and that's what this lady should do. She should recognize that there is a, an intrinsic contradiction between what she believes that she still has the traditional Catholic faith and all of its doctrines and all of well, them. And she should, she should recognize the Novus Ordo is not the practice of my faith. It's a practice of something alien. It's a, praction, a practice of something inimical to my faith, the Catholic faith. It's a practice of modernism. And she just has to recognize I can't continue this contradiction between what I believe and what I'm doing in the Novus Ordo. And so she has to stop this. She has to stop going. I mean, you know, to have the word. Well, she could go. Like she could go to a Protestant church, and hear more truth, uh, even as a confused mm -hmm. and as falsified as the scriptures are, in the Protestant churches. She she would actually accidentally almost hear more truth spoken by some of these Protestant ministers than she hears from the Novus Ordo clergy, who are trying to twist the gospels into the social gospel about, like Francis, global, you know, uh, global climate change and immigration policies and all the rest. And, um, you know, it's, not a, it's about having the truth. And the truth is the traditional Catholic faith. And the religion that is the practice of that is the traditional Catholic religion, and only that. Definitely not the Novus Ordo. If she has a relative who is being ordained in the Novus Ordo, she should... First of all, uh, realize that the, you know the very least we can say about the Novus Ordo ordination is it is doubtful. It was the very first sacrament that the moderns changed in 1968. The first thing they they changed wholesale. And uh, she also has to realize that um, you know this is this Novus Ordo ordination is to you're being ordained to be a presbyter in the Novus Ordo Church and practice the Novus Ordo religion. So if, if, she, if she doesn't see the contradictions between traditional Catholic faith and modernism, if she doesn't see the contradictions between the practice of the traditional Catholic religion and the Novus Ordo, then there's nothing I can explain to her. But if she sees those contradictions, she has to make a choice. One of them is from Christ, and one of them is definitely not. And so, I mean, I hope when she makes that decision, once and for all, she decides to be Catholic, true Catholic, traditional Catholic. What about... Uh, not modernist. She says here, Father, what, what about receiving the Eucharist, though? Isn't it important to receive the Eucharist? Sure, if it is the Eucharist, it's important not to receive a piece of bread. It's important to receive the Holy Eucharist. It's important to receive the Holy Eucharist in the context of the true Mass. Mm -hmm. It's important not to think that you're going up to uh, a presbyter <clears throat> of a new religion 
uh, and to a false uh, uh, New Order Mass, which is not really the sacrifice of Calvary at all, and to pretend that you're receiving the body of Christ. Not only that, if you believe that it is the body of Christ, and you see what they're doing it, doing to it, you're, you're taking part in an enormous sacrilege. Because if that is the body of Christ that they're slinging around, that they're handing out to everybody regardless, you know, um, uh, letting particles of the host fall where everybody's walking and so on. I mean, this is the most enormous sacrifice in the history of mankind. Sacrilege? Sacrilege. It's the most, uh, thank you. It is the most horrible sacrilege, don't, don't think, you know, within the human power of thought. I mean, the church has certain canons which automatically excommunicate a person in the most specially, in the most special way reserved to the Holy See itself. This is the, the most severe form of excommunication, automatic excommunication of the church. And among those, among those six things is deliberately defining the Blessed Sacrament, attacking the Blessed Sacrament. If one believes in the Novus Ordo that that is really the body of Christ that they're doing what they're doing there, and the blood of Christ, one would have to say, well, this is, this is the most horrendous sacrilege possible. This is mass uh, defilement of the Blessed Sacrament. Um, not only because of the mockery of the people who are living, you know, in their second or third marriages, right? People who are living, living with their boyfriends and girlfriends and cohabitating and so on, they just go up and put their hands out and receive alms, right? But even the way it's handed out with particles of the host law falling right where they're walking, you know? I mean, this is the most inconceivably horrible sacrilege possible. It's institutionalized in the new order. So how can anybody even believe that it is the body of Christ have anything to do with that? The, the, we, we have to be insistent on that with everyone. This is not the Catholic Church, no matter what they say, no matter what the media says, no matter what the conservative, so you know, Catholics say, no matter what the indult mass people say, the some some more important people say, no matter what the Vatican says. This is not the Catholic Church. This is modernism that has done these things, and they they're the ones who have set out attacking the church, and this is what they brought it to. Mm -hmm, definitely. They've been attacking the church ever since. And if, if, if somebody wants to, uh, you know, go back and look at that program, we did a conference, uh, a program called Modernism's Legacy of Perversion. Yes. <clears throat> let people go back and look at that if they haven't seen it. <clears throat> and let them, let them watch that. I think they'll understand where we get where we're coming from. That modernism setting in with a vengeance in Vatican II and after the, math of, uh, the aftermath of Vatican II immediately brought in these perversions. So somebody who's watching this happening now and who's totally you know, caught flat, has no idea, well, where did this happen? Where did, where did this all come from? They have to trace it right back to the day after Vatican II. They have to trace it back to the time of Vatican II itself when this has all started happening. And I'm talking about the perversions in the convents and the seminaries. It, it happened just like that because of the corrupt moral principles of the, mo of the modernists. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, people just have to stop acting so shocked by what's happening here. This has been going on and informing, and, and like the, this brood has been, has been hatch hatching in the Novus Ordo for decades now, ever since Vatican II. We're just living with the consequences of Vatican II now. If they can't trace this in their own minds back to Vatican II, they're making a serious mistake. And the mistake is going to be they're going to think it's the Catholic Church. Right. It is not the Catholic Church that's doing these things. It's the enemy, the arch enemies of Catholicism, and that's the modernists. Father, anyway, I, I recommend they go back and listen to that video if they haven't paid attention. If they, if they still think that this is the Catholic Church, they need to go back and watch it again. Definitely. Father, I actually heard <clears> that uh, one viewer said that's the best program that you've ever done. Is that right? history of what Catholics believe. So, yeah, it, yeah. It, um, definitely, yeah, I think that... That's well, I a, wish people would get a hold of that and send it to, you know, forward it to all their friends. Definitely, yeah. And, and say, you, you know, I've got to watch this. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not saying it's the best thing out there, but at least it, give, it should give them an idea of what's going on. Yeah. You know, all this talk, you know, they, they were saying, oh, it's not a pedophilia crisis, it's a homosexual crisis. <laughs> I say, no, no, no. no. It's a modernist crisis. From the very beginning, modernism has been the problem. That's the poison. That's the door that, through which all of these other evils have come. All of the others have piled in 
through modernism. Modernism is what opened that portal. Exactly. You know why people don't want to hear that? They don't want to hear it because they realize modernism. Well, gee, he's saying that the whole new order is wrong. No, gee, we can't, we can't say that, can we? He's tracing this back to Vatican II. We can't say that, can we? So they say, no, we, we, can't, we can't admit that, we can't listen to it. But the fact is, until they're willing to face that, they cannot possibly understand what's happening and they can do nothing to stop it. Exactly. You know, one of, the, one of their own exorcists recently, in the last few days, one of the own rather famous exorcists, actually, said that this is a satanic evil and it's only going to get worse. That's what he said. Right. It's only going to get worse. That doesn't bode well for them. But, you know, people are saying, oh, the modernists have been caught now. We've caught them. Now, now we see what they've been up to all this time, you know. If we can just get Francis to resign and maybe a half a dozen other cardinals, you know, we can make things right. Say, you have, no, you have no idea. You have no idea what this is all about here. Not only that, the people are wondering, why, why, didn't, why isn't Francis addressing that? People don't understand. This is not against the modernist plan. This was not some oops. You know, we, we didn't want this to get out. This is entirely according to the modernist plan. They wanted this to happen. Why? That's why they're not, they're not really making these big denials about it. You know. That's why Francis, Francis says, I'm not going to say one word. Why would the modernists, why would Francis and his gang, this council of nine he's got, half of whom, or more than half, are, are themselves named by either, either the name by Vigano or already under suspicion and already be investigated for their role in the, the cover-up of these sexual abuses. Why would these people who have hijacked the Catholic Church, or the institutions of the Church, and the name of the Catholic Church, why would they want this to happen? Time again, it all gets back to modernism. They want to restructure the Catholic Church. They want to reinvent the Church. They want to change the Church. And the only way they can get that, uh, get that accomplished is by changing the, the whole power structure within the Church. And they're going to do that in this way. They're going to get people saying, no, we can't accept this. Um, you know, even the claims for Francis, Francis to resign. Although these people may be outraged and want him to resign, that's fine. But the fact is, they're changing the whole idea of the papacy. The Pope's just got to come and go. You know, sign on, sign out, you know. And um, they don't realize that they're playing right into the hands of the modernists here. Yep. Even the, the conservative... Novus Ordo Catholics that are trying to practice the traditional faith within the Novus Ordo. Insofar as they're all agreeing in one, one voice, this is the Catholic Church that has done these evil things, they're playing right into the hands of the modernists. And um, the fact is, it, you know, if you wanted to ha have the worst case scenario for a traditional Catholic, if you wanted to have the perfect case scenario for a modernist, this is exactly what you'd have. The whole church being degraded in the eyes of the people everywhere, throughout the whole world. And um, you'd have, you know, just the idea that the Francis and his crew have been trying to restructure the church. Right now, Francis is meeting with his gang of nine in Rome, in the Vatican, right now. September 10th, 11th, 12th. They've been meeting here to provide to present their plan for the new structure of the church, the authority within the church, to decentralize the church. This is the modernist church, yep. okay? And uh, what could play better into their hands now than this, okay? If this whole sexual abuse crisis gets all of these civil governments involved, I mean, gets the governor and his... And his law enforcement people and his, his uh, you know, a, a, a district attorney and, you know, the attorney general of these various states, New York, New Jersey, uh, Illinois, Missouri, et cetera, et cetera, now. They're all getting into it now. All going to in investigate the diocese of the Catholic Church in their <laughs> states, right? But all this terrible abuse and all this cover-up, okay? What could better serve the modernist plan than that? 
I mean, even going back to Vatican II in the last document, I've talked about this before, but people need to pay attention, that the, the document on religious liberty of Vatican II brings in a right which is a blasphemy, you know, that, well, first of all, it is, it is, there's nothing wrong with this in Catholic teaching, that there is a civil right and a right from God that the individual has not to be compelled to act against his conscience. But Vatican II went beyond that. That last document of Vatican II actually brought up something that was not true, that the Church has never taught before, and even blasphemies, blasphemously said that it is a right that comes from God himself in heaven. And that is that no one can be restrained from acting according to his conscience. Now, a lot of people think, oh, that sounds pretty good, you know. Wait a minute. Hold the phone here. The church has never said that. It's a very big difference between being, being constrained or coerced to act against your conscience. But not being restrained to act according to your conscience, no matter how wrong it is. This is the whole premise of being pro-choice. <clears throat> the whole premise of being pro-choice is exactly that in the document of Vatican II on religious liberty. <clears throat> and that is you can't restrain somebody who thinks is right. We have to let them do it. So we have to allow them that choice if that's what they think is right. Kill babies. The fact that we see it as murder, you can do nothing about it. As long as they believe in their conscience it's okay, you can't stop them from aborting their babies. The whole pro-choice argument is, is embedded right there. The whole foundation of it is it, right in that document of Vatican II. And to say that God gives a person a right that no one can restrain him from acting according to his conscience? Wait a minute. What if your religion says smoke peyote? What if your religion is uh, worship Satan? What if your religion is abort babies? What if your religion is worship the goddess Kali and go out and murder people as a highwayman? I mean, you know, Kali, the Hindu goddess with all the skulls around her neck and weapons in her arms. Well, I mean, it's, they worship this. You know, then they're a bunch of cutthroats. But this is their religion. You mean to say this can't be restrained? Oh, but wait a minute. Somebody will read Dignitatis Humanae Personae on the dignity of the human person on religious liberty of Vatican II, right? And they'll say, but look, time and time it say, again it says, provided that just public order be maintained. So there's only one restraint that the document lists here. On the question of somebody acting according to his conscience, and that is the government. The only power, according to that document, that has this authority, it's the only one that mentioned, is the maintenance of just public order. So the civil government alone can restrain someone from acting according to his conscience, as long as just public order is, is, is preserved. Okay, look at this, though. Go back to the document of, of uh, Pope Pius X on, uh, on modernism, condemning the errors of the modernists. That's exactly what he says modernism says. Modernism says exactly what this document on religious liberty says. Because one is following his own religious sense. They even use the expression right out of, right out of Vatican II. Exactly what Pope Pius X says is the funda foundation of modernism and the faith of modernism the religious sense of the individual. Same expression, modernism. He says that the modernists believe that as long as you have your own personal experience of the divine, that's your faith, and you express your faith. But when you express your faith, you're expressing it through words and actions. Suddenly you're expressing this in society, and the civil government now has power to control that and to determine what you're allowed to say, and what you're allowed to do. He says that in 1907, this is the premise of the modernists. It's right here in Vatican II, in their document on religious liberty. And now you, you apply this here? I, I, you know, you can just see the modernist idea here <clears throat> applied to this uh, abuse situation, the sexual abuse situation now. Uh, you know, you could just see a, a prosecutor in Pennsylvania, in Illinois, in Missouri, wherever they happen to be, right? Saying, look, your own document of Vatican II says, we have the right to come in and enforce public order here. And you see what your church has been doing here. 
and the crimes that they've been committing here and presiding over. You know, uh, we have the right, according to your own document, to come in here. We have a right to take control and demand that you change the way you govern your church. And we're going to tell you how that should be. What could the modernists want more? If they want to conform the church to the modern world, what more perfect way to say, okay, civil authorities, come in here and remake the church for us, you know? And they will be glad to do so, too. They've given them the pretext for doing it right here in the document of Vatican II. So not only have they, have they given the foundation uh, for the principle of the whole pro-choice pro position, they've actually pr provided a platform for the civil authority now, from the, one of the very documents of Vatican II to say, we have to enforce uh, real public order here. What, is, what does he call it here? Provided that just public order be observed, okay? It follows that no one is to be act, forced to act in a matter contrary to his conscience, nor, on the other hand, is one to be restrained from acting in accordance <laughs> with his conscience. That's what it says. It says this is from God, too. So, actually, this is an endorsement of blasphemy. This actually says that God has given us a right to teach lies about him, because I believe them. Now, they may say, well, you believe them, so it's not really a blasphemy. You're not guilty of it, right? But God knows the truth. How can God give a right to someone to tell what God knows is a lie about himself? That's the very definition of blasphemy. And I have not only the right to profess that, I have the right to try to convince others of the truth of what I'm saying, even though it is a blasphemy. That's what Vatican II says. So Vatican II has endorsed all the false religions of the world. At the same time, setting the Catholic Church up, or what, they, what people consider the Catholic Church, to be made like the great... The great harlot. That's it. I mean, this is what the Protestants accuse, accuse the Catholic Church of being. This is what the modernists have made it. But it's the modernists. It's not Catholics. It's modernism. It's not Catholicism. We have to be absolutely certain about that. And we can't let that go. Uh, otherwise, people are going to be... This will be the great apostasy. Look what it says here. Again, provided just public order is observed. Provided the just demands of public order are observed. Quote, 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 quote. Over and over again. In this document. If I were a Josh Shapiro in Pennsylvania, or I were any one of these other DAs in one of the other states, I'd be looking at that document saying, hey, look, you all voted, you all voted for this, you know. This is what you canonize. This is your doctrine here. So... Um, not only can we come in and we, we're going to inf impose uh, just order now on your church because you can't do it, and Francis isn't about to do it, right? And your cardinals and bishops, they're not about to do it. We're the ones who have to do it. And so the question arises, can we coerce you to act contrary to your conscience, as they're trying to do in Pennsylvania, or in Australia right now, right? the confession, the secret mm -hmm. confession. Mm -hmm. No wonder they keep trying this, right? And they don't have a leg to stand on. Uh, to accept to say, well, we just, you know, just, we're just Catholics who can't do that. You can't force us to do that. This, uh, this sexual abuse problem, that's, that's the reason why they're saying we've got to step in and, and demand right. that we do it. Right. So it's a very sorted mess. And just, I, I just come back to a time. Modernism is a problem to which all of these other evils have entered. St. Pius X saw it well over 100 years ago. He saw what's happening today. Even though he died in 1914, he saw it all. And that's maybe well, that's what killed him, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. to see that. But, you know, we have to face it now, because we're staring it right into the jaws of this monster of modernism. People have to reject modernism if they're going to do what is right and go back to practicing the traditional faith. Um, but I wouldn't be a bit surprised, but this is exactly what the modernists are thinking. We want to change the church into a worldly institution entirely, and what better way to do it than to do it like this? The modernists. They follow this this uh, whole Francis idea to a T. Who am I to mm -hmm. judge? You mm -hmm. know, like you mentioned in, in the the program, the, the modernism <laughs> program of uh, of the the nun, the one sister who wanted to to go to confession and and, mm -hmm. and confess this great crime to this priest. You know, he he refused to pass judgment mm -hmm. on her, and that's that's the Nova Sordo in a nutshell, right there. They might get up in the pulpit <clears> and say. This is terrible. This is bad. Can't mm -hmm. can't do abortion. It's a sin. There's homosexuality. All this is crazy. It's pedophilia. Everything. It's so bad. Mm -hmm. But who am I to judge? I'm mm -hmm. not going to pass judgment. Right. And so nothing happens.
It, it, well, it's something does happen, it's and it's an very endorsement. evil, an endorsement of the evil that God has condemned, but they will not. Right. So Francis says, I cannot pass judgment, but God has already judged this. Yeah. And, um, you know, you know, Tom, you're right. This is exactly the primordial evil there. What are the first words in Latin of this document? Dignitatis humane, of human dignity. This is 1965 here, in the Vatican II Church, okay? 1965 of human dignity. Now the French revolutionaries, their battle it was all about human dignity, okay? Bolsheviks, they all talk about they all talk about human dignity. And they they cite human dignity as their authority against God. That the, the demands of the of conscience are sacred. And God even has no right. This is what liberalism is all about. This is the very nature of liberalism. Yeah. Human dignity against against God's dignity, you know. Man has a right to defy God. And, uh, you know, you see where this whole idea of human dignity goes and what they make of it, see? But this, this is that, uh, that is that the temptation of Satan in the garden long ago. And human dignity, you know? Separate yourself, stand up for yourself, be your own God. Uh, you have it within you, right? You have the right to it, right? Mm -hmm. No one, including God, can tell you not to do this. Right. So um, it, it is. It is very evil. This is the fundamental premise of modernism, and we see what it has done. And again, people have to face the fact that these seminaries and convents were being corrupted in 1966, and 1965, and 1964, and this has been going on all this time. It's just exploding now because now these people are bishops and cardinals. Right. That's why it's exploding. They've worked themselves up through the ranks now and they're getting into those positions. Now this is where it's getting, um, it's, it's just becoming, uh, you know, endemic, and, it's, and it's, it's, it, there's no way to contain this, you know. It's, it, it's out of the box, so, so to speak, you know. Mm -hmm. They can hush it up for so long. But as I say, now they, it's, it's not as though they really even want to stifle it. Why? Well, because um, they want to be seen as the champion of homosexuality, they will not say anything. Francis even made a mistake, you know, on that on that flight from Dublin to Rome in August. What was it? August twenty sixth, when he 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 said, "I will not say one word about this." He also made a mistake when he was asked about the homosexual crisis, and he talks about what about parents who have children growing up and say they want to, they're yeah. kind of homosexual. He says, "Well, there are ways we can help them. We can talk about this. We can talk about this." And, you know, it's basically discernment, discernment. But he even talks about psychiatric help. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. They were quick to jump all over that. You know, they, the Vatican withdrew that word. They took the word right out of that statement. They apologized for that. They don't dare say something about this evil. But why? <clears throat> it's because of modernism. Uh, it's because even those who are not homosexuals are still modernists. And they're still making the whole this whole thing into a, into a devil, devil's playground. That's what they're doing. Seminaries, the conference, so on and so forth. So um, people have to have to face the fact. Otherwise, they are part of the. They're all aiding and abetting the evil. They're all crying. They're all crying with everyone else. Crucify him! Crucify him! They're all crying. That even the conservatives, even the conservatives, going to the 1962 Latin Mass within the Novus Ordo. They might as well be in the crowd yelling with the rest of them, crucify him, crucify him. Because they're all saying, oh, this is the church, this is the church. Look at what has become of the church. It, it's sickening to go online and seeing what some of these people are saying. You know, Oh, the church has fallen so far, she's so wicked now. Uh, we have to find a way to redeem her and to purify her, the church, the church. You know, e even some people will, will go to uh, the book of the Apocalypse. And they'll go to chapter 2. And they'll look at uh, what the angels are saying to the churches. Now, you know, the fathers of the church tell us that the different churches, the seven different churches, are, represent the history of the Catholic Church throughout time. And uh, they'll say, well, look, you know, here the angels spoke to the church of Sardis, the church of uh, uh, Philadelphia, and so on and so forth, Laodicea, and so on, and we'll say, well, but find fault with it. Find fault with it. Well, this... 
this I have against you, or this I have against you. There's even one that talks about that you're oppressed by those who are say they are, say they are Christ, say they are of Christ, but they're the synagogue of Satan. Remember that? It's in there. Apocalypse chapter two. It's all in there. They say that they are of Christ, but they are actually of the synagogue of Satan. But even there, the distinction is made between what is really Catholic and what is not, what pretends to be, but really isn't. You know? And others might look and say, well, look, even in the other ones that, you know, God found fault with the church in various places. Yeah, she found weaknesses. I mean, the, the, the uh, apocalypse and the word of God spoken there finds weaknesses in the church in var at various times. But that's very different from what you find here. You find this is just corrupt to its very core. That's not an argument for what we're witnessing here. But if you go and you look down the list of those and you find that they say they are of Christ, but they're actually of the synagogue of Satan, now you realize that Christ himself is saying, make that distinction. And I wouldn't be surprised, but he's referring to this, this moment. Make that distinction between what is the synagogue of Satan and what is not the Catholic Church, <clears throat> the modernists, as opposed to those who are still faithful and remain Catholic. Father, perhaps it would be uh, beneficial at some point to do a show talking about uh, St. Robert Bellerin's definition of, of what the church actually is. I know you have a, uh, an excerpt from him that you frequently refer to, so perhaps that those... You know, Tom, we should. There, there are also other shows we've done where we talk about what it is to be a traditional Catholic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think people who haven't seen those should go back and they should look at them. Mm -hmm. It would answer a lot of their questions. By the way, you know, um, even... Uh, you're familiar with, with uh, Cardinal Genswein? Genswein, right? He was uh, a confidant of uh, Benedict, Benedict, now of Francis, right? Very interesting. Put it here. Pope Benedict's top aide broaches the abuse crisis, quotes Cardinal's ap apocalyptic critique of Francis. I mean, he's even saying here, they're, they're even quoting uh, this uh, Cardinal Willem Jacobus Eich, <coughs> from Utrecht in the Netherlands, is quoting from their own, the, the Catholic Catechism, the, the, the new catechism they come up with, and is applying the words of their catechism to the, referring to the final trial which will shake the faith of many, but which the church has to endure before the return of Christ, quote unquote, mm -hmm. in their new catechism. And he's saying that may be Francis. Francis might be that last great trial. Are they naming him? No, but they're saying they're talking about this problem. And the problem of Viganot's accusations against Francis brought up that comment. That maybe this is the last great trial, the church that we read in our catechism. But you know something interesting? If you go back to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 2, right? Um, he talks about. Um, the great apostasy, which evidently this is supposed to refer to. Mm -hmm. He says this will be a prelude to the coming of the Antichrist. They don't mention that here. They say this is what will happen before the coming of Christ. <laughs> but the actual prophecy in St. Paul is that the great apostasy will be the prelude to the coming of the Antichrist, mm -hmm. the man of sin. I, th I found that very curious, that they would make this reference. But Genswein says, he also noted, according to this article, which it appears in LifeSite News, so much of the good stuff is coming from there. And this is a quote from him. The church who had been rooted among the people into which we have been born, and which never existed in such, such as in America, as it existed in Europe, that church has long died in this process of darkening. I mean, he's speaking in apocalyptic terms here. And if you talk about the process of darkening, what is he talking about? He's talking about Vatican II. If he's talking about the history of this sexual abuse crisis, he's talking about the years of Vatican II, because it exactly coincides with the years of Vatican II. He even asks, does this sound too dramatic to you? He goes on, and he, he even refers to Benedict, the light of the Christian civilization is being extinguished everywhere in the West. These are words of Benedict. But he was, a, he was a big part of that, right? And uh, you know that Ganswein, speaking recently, 
uh, likened what was going on in the in the church. Again, I say it's the modernist church. To 9/11, he says this is like 9/11 in the church. Now, now remember, uh, Ratzinger, Benedict the Sixteenth, said that Vatican II was the French Revolution in the Church. Now, Ganswein, a great representative of the Novus Ordo, of course, under Benedict and Francis, is saying that the sexual abuse crisis, crisis is like 9/11 in the Church, right? This disaster, <laughs> and um, you know, again. To get back to even what out of their own mouths it condemns uh, modernism, Vatican II, and uh, the whole Novus Ordo, right from, right from the beginning, stands condemned. Now, I just wish um, people would uh, be willing to face reality and uh, acknowledge it for what it really is. Sure. These this Council of Cardinals that Francis has, has joined to him, right? Baladiaga and O'Malley and the rest of them. You know? So many of them already are implicated. No wonder the headlines are now reading, they pledge full solidarity with Francis. But they've been pledging full solidarity with Francis all this time. <laughs> that's why they're in this. That's why they're in this trouble, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, Francis pledges full solidarity with them too, right. in the evils that they've done. But they're going to stick together and they're going to take, uh, they're going to take it down. And they're going to rejoice at doing it. Hey, you know, you know, I'm sorry for going on about this, but look what we've been witnessing all this time. As the seminaries have been emptying, emptying, right? The convents have been emptying. Right? All these terrible things have been going on. The church has been declining. Even Benedict acknowledged that. They have been rejoicing. They said, we're, yes, this is the, Vatican II is the most wonderful thing to ever happen. Okay? Right? And Francis recently came out and said, you know, we've got to do away with this clericalism and let the lay people take over. Basically, he's saying that. Let the lay people take over. He wants to fundamentally replace the, the Catholic Church with his own modernist religion. Let the lay people take over. He's rejoicing at this. The former bishop of this diocese, Cincinnati, this archdiocese, was, when I first arrived here back in the mid-80s, fomenting this program of his called the For the Harvest Program. Now, I'm talking about, you know, almost 40 years ago now. And um, he was saying, we don't have the vocations we need for the priesthood. And so that's the downside. But he said, the upside is that the laity now have to come and fill in their place. This is what the modernists want, you know. They, they supposedly lament the lack of vocations, but they rejoice that now the laity can take over these positions. Francis just recently was essentially saying the same thing, that the hour of the laity has been stuck and we haven't been able to move forward. But now that we can denounce the clericalism responsible for this abuse and, and do away with this clericalism, it's a priesthood. Sounds like a good process. It's the priesthood. It's exactly what they want. Don't let them fool you. They're not lamenting this. They're rejoicing about this. This is what they were driving toward all this time. They want to drag the church's name down so low that mankind rejects the church as she was, as she really should be, as she is. And um, <coughs> that they, they, they come up with this, this, this modern and, and monstrous construct of the, the, the full-blown modernist church, totally the religion of the world, uh, totally the one world religion. They want to bury the Catholic church is what they want to do. And they want to bury the Catholic faith and the Catholic religion with it. We can't let them do that. Not if we love our Lord and they're faithful to Him. So anyway, I think we, we really need to face it. Now, I don't know if anybody else is saying this. I mean, there might be others out there who are actually saying this. But I don't hear them. But I hear over and over again as the Catholic Church has done these terrible things and it's a homosexual crisis and blah, 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 get Francis to resign and so on and so forth. And they haven't a clue, it seems to me, for what it's worth. It, that they, they haven't a clue. They're not willing to face the reality that the Novus Ordo itself is rotten to the core in its very principles, and it has to be abandoned. We have to get back to practicing, practicing the true faith. That's, uh, I'll say it again and again, you know. And, uh, <laughs> but maybe that's the last time I'll say it tonight. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, by the way, excuse me. That's okay. Francis has come out to say that this is the devil's work. Mm -hmm. But what, what does he say is the devil's work? 
Yeah. Not that the bishops have done these things, the not that the accused. clergy have done, but that they're being accused of these things. Mm -hmm. That's what he says. Yeah. He says the devil is the great accuser, the great Satan, right? The great adversary or accuser. And it's what the devil does is he accuses, accuses. So who's the bad guy? The accusers, yeah. right? This is really bad. This is, this is just downright diabolically evil. But that's what Francis is saying here. Pope Francis at Mass, this is at the Casa Santa Marta, says during one of his homilies, bishops must pray to overcome the great accuser. I think his name is Viganò, <laughs> Carlo Maria Viganò. He's the great accuser, right? Yes. This is the work of Satan, mm -hmm. to accuse the bishops of these evil things. Not that they have done these evil things, but to say that they have done these evil things. That's the evil. And uh, I'm afraid that so many members of Francis's new modernist religion will actually fall right in line behind him and say, yes, this is the problem, <clears throat> that people are accusing them of doing these things. Um, I just hope that there are many of them who will not be deceived by this. Father, we have some... Uh, go ahead. I, I know this is all very negative, but unfortunately all the news is negative. All the news is negative. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm saying the positive is that there are many people mm -hmm. who have not fallen into this net. Yeah. They've not fallen into the net and the snare of modernism. Mm -hmm. And they are trying to be faithful to our Lord. So I'm like, I can't help but think that's why our Lord is still sparing us. There's a reason why. Um... God has not struck, though, the, the, his arm has not fallen. I mean, we still can wake up in the morning and look forward to a day and, and I mean, how, how, who knows how close we are, you know. But we know how much we deserve uh, God's punishment. But, you know, there must be those in the world who are, who are being faithful to our Lord at great cost, okay? And I, I can't help but believe that those who are following the traditional Catholic faith are among them, right? Uh, the the, the day-to-day -day traditional Catholics. There are others who are suffering for our Lord, great things, you know, also. But it is no mean thing for a person to practice the traditional Catholic faith and be faithful to Christ in the world today. That's a great thing. With all of the pressures we've got, you know, uh, Jeremiah Denton re returned from six and a half years of captivity with the communist Viet Cong being tortured every day. But when he got back to the States, he said the pressures being brought to bear on the young people of America are worse than anything he had to endure as a prisoner of the Viet Cong and the tortures they inflicted on him. The pressures, the social pressures on our young people. Now we're talking about the aftermath, like the late 1960s, but he said that, right? So, I mean, to maintain your faith and your fidelity to Christ today, that is a wonderful thing. That is a great thing. That's, that's all we're asking others. We're asking everyone to do that. Um, so I, I just um, wanted to bring up a positive note, that there are great souls in the world still. We love our Lord very much. And there might still be some who are actually imprisoned in the Novus Ordo. Uh, but they're prisoners of their own minds, in the sense that the Novus Ordo has imprisoned them by uh, false principles. And as soon as they see the clear, as soon as they see the clear way and resolve the dilemmas in their minds that the Novus Ordo has put there, the dilemmas that the Novus Ordo has put there to keep them confined, they'll be right out of the Novus Ordo and back to the traditional faith in no time. And they'll be asking themselves, why didn't I see this before? Why didn't I understand this before? Mm -hmm. How did I let them deceive me all this time? The graces are there. Mm. Father, do you think that our Blessed Mother will save us from this mess? <clears throat> well, uh, you have to remember. You remember what I was talking about, uh, the Church having to relive the life of Christ, mm -hmm. involving his triumphs, but also his sufferings, right? Well, this involves the Church also going through the passion of Christ being unjustly accused of crimes that she's not the criminal she's the victim of, right. right? As our Lord himself was unjustly accused, that she will be charged and she will be found guilty and she will be condemned and she will be tortured. 
The church must undergo this as our Lord himself did. We're going to witness this. And so we must not be surprised to find a great apostasy as everyone abandoned our Lord, right? The apostles themselves. St. John came out of the shadows at one point, but to stand with our Blessed Mother. And Mary Magdalene and a very small, small company, right? <clears throat> were there on Calvary. So, I mean, what could be more emblematic of the great apostasy than that moment? You know? So we're going to, I'm not know that we're, we're living and we're going to live to see that moment. But I do think we're living through this time when our Lord is being accused by his enemies and being um, you know, attacked from every side and going to be charged and going to be set upon and uh, going to be persecuted, tortured, and ultimately, you know what happened to our Lord, and the church having to mirror that in her own existence, will appear to be dead. You know, our Lord himself asked, when the Son of Man returns to earth to judge, do you think he will find faith on earth? I mean, the, the rhetorical question begs the answer, no. And so I think this is a clear indication that the church is going to be underground again. And the world will consider that it has buried the church, because the church will, will be underground. It's the only place it will be possible. You, can't, you will not be publicly able to profess uh, your faith in Christ, uh, the true faith in Christ. So the church will essentially be buried, but, and the world will even consider it to be dead, and will rejoice over that. But that, remember what our Lord told the apostles? You will be sorrowful, you will be terribly sorrowful by the events to come, but the world will rejoice, but your sorrow will be turned into joy. And the world ultimately will be in mourning you know, when they see Christ risen and glorified. And so if the church is, as I'm sure it is, because this is the tradition of the church, we've been told, is going to have to relive the life of Christ, then we're going to have to find in the creed, was crucified, died, and was buried. But on the third day, the church will rise. The church will rise because of the divine power within her that they cannot kill, right? And they cannot prevent that resurrection of the church any more than they could prevent the resurrection of our Lord. Right? No matter how big a guard they posted that tomb, they're not going to stop the resurrection. Mm -hmm. So I think we have to face the fact that this is the future. Now, when it's going to arrive, I don't know. I tend to think that because of the situation going on today, we're very much into that part where the church is standing Possibly even before the Sanhedrin, possibly even before Pilate, possibly on the verge of that. Am I being melodramatic? St. Pius X, in his first encyclical, said that he was terrified to become the Pope in 1903 because he thought we were very in the very moment, or about to be on the very threshold of that moment, of the Antichrist coming into the world. He referred to the prophecies of, you know, St. Paul to Thessalonians, chapter 2. He referred to that, the great apostasy. That's what he himself said. So I don't think we're being melodramatic any more than he was. So uh, I think the, the point that you make about the Blessed Mother, is our Blessed Mother <clears throat> was able to accompany our Lord even to the cross. And even though she was not allowed to put out her hand to help him. I mean, it wasn't she who wiped the blood off the face of our Lord. It was Veronica. It wasn't she who helped our Lord carry the cross. It was Simon. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't she who was able to reach out and, and just do anything for him. This was part of her crucifixion, as a crucifixion of her mother's love for him, that all he, she could do is endure with him, and she could provide no relief for him. But nonetheless, you know that our Blessed Mother's presence there was a, the greatest consolation to our Lord because of her absolute fidelity, her sinlessness. This was the, the product of his suffering that he was going through. So even though in the Garden of Gethsemane he saw all of these millions of souls that were condemned to hell because they rejected what he was suffering for them, I mean, always before him, standing underneath the cross, he had the vision, he had, he had the sight of this Blessed Mother, 
this faithful soul in realizing that her fidelity was his work, the work of his suffering, no matter who else was faithful or not, there she was, right? This was certainly a, a tremendous consolation and comfort to our Lord to see her there, right? And one of his last acts in mortal life was to provide for her, you know, with St. John. So I, I can't help but think that in what the Church is going to be facing now, the Blessed Mother is going to be able to play a very important role. Uh, that she is going to, with the Church, step by step, on the way to Calvary, and she's going to be there even when the Church undergoes a kind of crucifixion, that the Blessed Mother is going to be accompanying it, and she is going to be a source of tremendous strength and uh, tremendous comfort and great consolation to the faithful at that time. So uh, it's not as though that she's going to be able to prevent this any more than she was able to prevent our Lord's crucifixion. She never would think of trying to do it. <laughs> but she's the one with the wedding feast of Cana asked him to begin the road to Calvary, right? right? Because she knew it was God's will. Even though she knew her own heart would be pierced there. She volunteered. She was the handmaid of the Lord always. At the Annunciation, at the Crucifixion, at the Resurrection, she was always the handmaid of the Lord. So she will be here with the Church. Uh, but yes, I, I do believe our Blessed Lady, uh, through all of the, the, the times of the modernists and all the rests uh, of the enemies of the Church, that she will be walking with the Church step by step through all of its trials and tribulations. That's very beautiful, Father. Yeah. Your sorrow shall be turned to joy. Father, thank you for being here today. Oh, you're welcome, Tom. Thank you. You know, you mentioned uh, the feast of the birthday of Lee, September 8th. Holy Name of Mary, September 12th, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. The sorrows of Lee, seven sorrows uh, on the 15th. Mm -hmm. But the 24th, we have Our Lady of Ransom, which was about rescuing Catholics from the clutches of modernist enslavers, slave drivers, right? September 24th, the Feast of Our Lady of Ransom. You have October 7th, the Feast of Our Lady of the Rosary, mm -hmm. which is a celebration of the Battle of Lepanto and the victory there. Right? Mm -hmm. And you have the Feast of October 11th, the Feast of the Maternity of Our Blessed Lady, which is the foundation of her vocation, which is the source of all the privileges that she had. So you have within this vaguely month's time, the span of a month, the, all of these tremendous, beautiful feast days of Our Blessed Mother. And um, I don't know what the Novus Order was done with to all of those, you know, but uh, now they've adulterated them and just sapped them of their spiritual significance. <clears throat> but in traditional Catholic Catholicism, you will find Our Lady meeting you day by day throughout the year in these liturgical celebrations, these feast days at the altar. You'll find her there. And as a traditional Catholic, I'm, I'm so grateful to our Lord for providing that, that blessed presence of Our Lady throughout, throughout our year. I, you know, encountering her at the altar on these feast days is so beautiful. So, uh, it's something that I wish for everybody. I wish they would come back to that. Sounds good. Thank you, Father. I certainly do. God bless you. Thanks to all of our viewers as well for watching this episode of What Catholics The following Believe. program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Hello and welcome to What Catholics. This is another special edition here addressing the crisis now in the Novus Ordo Church regarding the letter of Archbishop Vigano regarding Francis and his involvement in the abuse crisis. I uh, published uh, today at the Immaculate Conception Church a, a little monograph I had done, which I didn't include in the bulletin, but I alluded to last week's bulletin. I'd like to read that little monograph that I wrote now and comment on it. Last week's bulletin briefly mentioned the Pennsylvania Grand Jury Report about hundreds of New Order clergymen abusing 1,000 children and teenagers over 60 years in just six dioceses. Last week's sermon told about the appearance of Archbishop Vigano's letter detailing the complicity of Vatican II church prelates and Francis himself in the 40-year predatory activities of Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, 
a close associate of Francis, who influenced his choices of bishops and cardinals. All of this has filled the news, seized the attention and dominated discussions of people throughout the world during this past week, with many voices demanding that Francis resign as Supreme Pontiff of the New Order. During his in-flight press conference from Dublin to Rome last Sunday, a journalist asked Francis about the letter and its accusations. Francis answered, I read the statement this morning and I must tell you sincerely that I must say this to you and all those who are interested. Read the statement carefully and make your own judgment. I will not say a single word about this. I believe the statement speaks for itself. And you have the journalistic capacity to draw your own conclusions. It is an act of trust. When some time passes and you have drawn your own conclusions, I may speak. But I would like your professional maturity to do the work for you. It will be good for you. Now, Swiss Bishop Marian Eleganti has called Francis's statement, quote, a classic non-denial denial. But Francis' statement actually appears to be rather a non-denial admission. When Francis continues, quote, I believe that statement speaks for itself. He's right about that. Archbishop Vigano's statement certainly does speak for itself. But Francis will not speak for himself. And does he then tell the press that he expects them to deal with the Archbishop, that he expects them to deal with Archbishop Vigano's letter, encouraging them to draw their own conclusions? He then says, quote, it's an act of trust. Well, whose trust? Francis's trust in them? His trust in them to do what? Francis's trust in them to deal with the problem. Is it purely accidental that the liberal so-called Catholic press immediately began to attack Archbishop Vigano's honesty, integrity, and credibility? The Archbishop was already then in hiding, out of reach of the Vatican, and beyond the wrath of the New Order's deviant syndicate. Has Francis called upon his allies in the liberal press to, quote, fix the problem for him? Did Francis set the press hounds on Vigano to tear him apart by character assassination? Whether or not Francis gave the order, that's exactly what they've done. And Francis concluded his non-answer with this peculiar statement. When some time passes and you have drawn your conclusions, I may speak. Now, I'm not the only one who raises this question of whether Francis was in fact signaling to his press agents in uh, the Catholic press, as it's called, or the secular press for that matter, that he was signaling to them that he expects them to take care of the problem, that he really has nothing that he can say, but it's up to them to say what's necessary, that is, to discredit the letter of Archbishop Vigano by discrediting him, well, in First Things, dated August 31st, 2018, John Waters writes in Francis and the Journalists, when you read the Pope's response again in light of what has happened or not happened, in the several days since, it acquires an ominous tenor, inviting a stab at a new translation. Here is mine. So John Waters then gives his own translation of Francis's statement. And I quote, read the statement in the knowledge of the relationship you and I share. We are men and women of the world and like-minded on what is important. We know where we stand on matters like homosexuality and homosexual priests. But be careful how you handle this Vigano business. A wrong word could undo all we have achieved. I have faith in you to figure out who this man is. Do your work well, and there will be no need for me to risk my position. 
Once you have defused the situation, I will deal with Vigano for the record. We are all adults here. I know I can count on you. I need your help on this, but we have an understanding that has worked well so far. Trust me. These words do not represent an actual translation of what Francis says, but John Waters says his words can be understood in this way. And I thought it was interesting that he pointed this out because I have not seen this interpretation anywhere else, really. Uh, perhaps one other site that, was, that I was directed to hinted at this idea. But the idea that Francis was actually unloosing the hounds of the press to go after Vigano to discredit him, and only then would Francis have anything to say after they had done their, their dirty work, as it were, uh, is not beyond the pale, and I'm not the only one who's interpreting and understanding Francis this way. Sad to say. In any case, whether that is exactly what Francis meant or not, it is exactly what has happened. In fact, uh, Il Giornale of Italy uh, actually went so far as to contact uh, France, uh, Vigano's sister and brother, one brother and one sister, to get a, a statement from the sister that her brother, Archbishop Vigano, had somehow defrauded her in some real estate deal. And so they will stoop to that even, to contact his member of his, of his family to get the complaints of family members against him. Not that it reflects really on what he says, but they wanted to reflect on him and use that to discredit him so as to draw the attention away from the letter and make it not a question of what Vigano can testify about, what Francis has done, but rather to make this all about Vigano himself. That is what they want to be done. So it's no longer about Francis, now it's all going to be about Vigano himself. This is what the liberals, what the leftists, what the modernists do. Now, Francis has both refused to answer the, quack, the accusations and he refuses to resign. His Secretary of State, Pietro Cardinal Parolin, says that Francis is not worried about this matter and the Francis-appointed Archbishop of Chicago, Cardinal Supic, stated that Francis has more important things to concern him, such as immigration and climate change. Although Supic was widely criticized for calling immigration and climate change a higher priority than his Pope's involvement in the abuse of young people by New Order predatory priests and cardinals, nonetheless, Supic appears to know well the mind of Francis who just yesterday made a statement calling the accumulation of plastic in the world's oceans an emergency. But Francis does not consider the accusations in Vigano's letter an emergency. Do Francis and his prelates not consider this affair an emergency? Does the accusation that Francis himself aided and abetted the abuse of children not pose a crisis for him or for his prelates, a confident, a confidant of Francis, Jesuit Father Anthony Spadaro says that Francis is energized by this controversy because it is bothering the right people, that is the conservatives. Although some of those cardinals and bishops who could be charged with the crime of covering up the abuse are certainly worried about their own legal fortunes, they do not appear to be concerned so much for the good of the church. Francis' Secretary of State, again, Cardinal Pietro Parolin, assures us that Francis himself is not at all worried about the furor sparked by Archbishop Vigano's accusations. If this is true, we might draw the following conclusions and have the following expectations. Despite the uproar, the modernists are confident that they have enough control to ride out this storm because, one, their leftist agents and liberal allies in politics and in the media remain powerful enough to protect and support them. The modernists are also confident they have enough control to ride out the storm because, secondly, their opponents will tire of the effort and eventually settle for a token solution 
which shuffles the offending bishops or replaces them with other modernists. This is what happened when this whole thing first came to light about 12, 15 years ago. It's exactly what they did. And, of course, everyone calmed down and went back to business as usual, including the modernists and the homosexuals. A third reason why the modernists have confidence that this will blow over like a storm at sea is that even now very few people acknowledge that the root of the problem is modernism and that all the other evils follow from what the modernists have done and continue to do. In fact, for the longest time, people were saying that it's a problem of pedophilia, but now they've come to realize this is a problem of homosexuality. This is a problem with homosexuals uh, who've made the church a kind of playground for themselves. But they're still missing the point. Even there, they're missing the point that the problem is not really essentially a problem of uh, a pedophilia or pederasty or homosexuality, it is a problem of modernism. It is modernism that has allowed these evils to enter the church. It is the modernist morality that has come in with Vatican II that has led this, the church in this direction. And before I close, I'm going to give you some evidence for that. For those who will not acknowledge that fact, who insist that the changes that have been made by the modernists in what they call the new order are not responsible for this happening. They need to face the truth. They need to face reality. I mean, even Archbishop Vigano, his, practically his entire clerical life was in the Novus Ordo Church. He was raised uh, in the traditional church before Vatican II, but nonetheless, as a clergyman, his life has really been, been conducted within the context of the Novus Ordo. As a clergyman, that's what he knows. He knows the Novus Ordo. I don't know that he himself would look beyond the question of Francis knowing the, the, the truth about Cardinal McCarrick and yet empowering him to continue to pray upon the young of the church. I don't know if, if, Cardinal, if uh, Carlo Maria Vigano himself would acknowledge that it is modernism and it is the new order that is at the root, the problem of all of this. I just don't know. So we need to get past that issue and we need to understand clearly that modernism is the problem. As long as the modernists now in the Vatican uh, can see that people are blaming other things, even homosexuality, as the root of this problem. We're not really addressing the problem at its foundation, and that is the modernists and what they've done to the church in Vatican II and afterwards. The modernists can take comfort from that and therefore expect again that the point being missed, the storm will blow over and they will be back in power again and free to do as they please. And there will be other crises that will come. Now, the fourth reason why the modernists might be confident that nothing will come of this eventually, and they can wait this out, is the fact that they really can't lose. In their own minds, they really can't lose. Why? Well, because they're actually glad that some people will rally to defend them and their new order, <laughs> and that they don't really care about those who will lose the faith and fall away. They don't really care about those people who fall away. Why? Well, because one of their central tenets is ecumenism. And ecumenism basically says <clears throat> salvation can come in different forms through different religions. <clears throat> one does not have to be a Catholic in order to be saved. After all, Francis said that atheists can be saved by their goodwill. And so when people fall away from the church, even the, the nice modernists can say, oh, well, they're not losing salvation for falling away from the church because they can go find salvation somewhere else. So they wouldn't be concerned about people leaving the Catholic church and perhaps going off and joining another. Ecumenism says, that's fine. Let them go choose something that suits them better. Why would, they, why would they care about that? But not only that, 
But the, the modernists want the conservatives out anyway. So if the conservatives are going to fall out of the church, this is exactly what they want. Francis would like nothing better than these conservatives to simply give up and walk away and leave him alone and rid his church of this, this trouble that conservatives bring because they're so focused on doctrine and morals. And uh, so the fallout from this crisis, again, the modernists would see as a positive if it gets the conservatives to, to give up and go away. Also, the modernists really want to undermine the church as the one true church of Christ. They want to undermine that idea. You know, the modernists have even made concessions to those who want the 1962 Latin Mass. They've made concessions to them and let them have their extraordinary form. But what they all have to give up is the idea that there is one true God who has one true Son, who has taught one true faith, and uh, established one true church through whom and through which alone there is salvation. The modernists want us to lose that idea entirely. They let us have the Latin Mass as long as we give up the idea of there being one true faith outside of which there is no salvation. And so the modernists want to undermine this idea and what could better serve their purpose of one true church, holy, catholic, and apostolic, than what is being done now under their auspices. <clears throat> um, even, those, even those who will stay with them, as uncomfortable as they may be, will still have this idea. And this is something, by the way, that I think really needs to be uh, emphasized. You see, the, the word on the street out there, the word in the press, the word echoing throughout the world right now, is that the Catholic Church has done this terrible thing. The, the liberals in the media, the leftists, the, all of them are chortling this. The Catholic Church has done this. You know what's curious? The conservative Novus Ordo people are saying the same thing. They're in agreement with all the voices of the left. Those who are going to the Novus Ordo, even those who are, let's say, in the indult mass, or the summa the Samorum Pontificum Mass in the Novus Ordo. Those who go to a Novus Ordo diocese to practice the traditional faith within the Novus Ordo and under their auspices are all agreeing with the leftists. Yes, this is the Catholic Church. The people who have done this are the legitimate representatives of the Catholic Church. And therefore, it is the Catholic Church that has done these terrible crimes. They're playing right into the hands of the modernists, right into their hands. Only the traditional Catholics have the sense to say, look, we know this cannot be the church. This cannot be the church any more than it can be Christ himself. This cannot be the Catholic church that has done these terrible things. It is the enemy of the church who's invaded and taken control and are, is now occupying these positions of power but they are using these positions of power to attack the church from within and to degrade her and tear down the very idea of the church in the eyes of the people and to offend God dreadfully. This is, they, these are the enemies of the church who have done these things. This is not the Catholic Church. We have to insist on that. It is a tragedy, of course, that people are, be, are willing to believe now this mantra that is being passed off as truth, as common wisdom that this is the Catholic Church. But these are the modernists who have done this. They have done this not, not in the name of the Church. Well, they have done it in the name of the Church. That's, that's the problem. But what is true is that they can't really do it in the name of the Church, honestly. They're doing it in the Church and they're doing it, they're doing it to the Church. They're inflicting these crimes upon the Church. But the real crime the real crime that started all of this was the crime that went on when they changed the faith, when they changed the religion, when what came out of Vatican II was a, a blank check to the modernists to craft a modernist religion to go with their modernist faith that they imposed at Vatican II. Again, there are people who will say, oh, that's not true, that's an exaggeration, but wait, before I'm done, I want to refer to something that actually happened immediately after Vatican II that I think shows very clearly what we're dealing with here. 
So, again, you know, the modernists feel that they're going to be able to ride out this storm. And so we see that their tactics, now their reactions have changed. <coughs> and I don't mean to be um, pedantic about it, but I would say that their tactics uh, in a matter of a week's time have gone from uh, thrashing mode and trashing mode to, uh, well, actually lashing mode. And I'll explain what I mean by that. Uh, a, uh, the founder of a, a prominent business software company here in the United States, a company that is now actually throughout the world, explained to me what thrashing mode meant in computer jar jargon. And it has to do with the computer is overwhelmed. Um, when it's overwhelmed with data <coughs> and overwhelmed with tasks, and it is going from one to the other and cannot complete anything. <coughs> cannot really effectively do any job. Well, I think that was the initial reaction of the modernists at the word of, well, actually at the, uh, all the way back <coughs> at the beginning of August when the uh, grand jury in Pennsylvania published its report. I think initially the modernists went into thrashing mode trying to figure out what do we do, what do we do to save face? What do we do to cover up the cover-up now? But when they, when they got beyond that and pulled themselves together, I think that the next mo mode they went into was trashing mode. And I think that was Francis' signal, not only to the press, but I think it was a signal to also his uh, abusing uh, modernist uh, bishops and cardinals and priests now we have to go after Vigano, and we have to trash his name. <clears throat> we have to undermine him. That's our defense. The best defense is a good offense. But now I think they've gone to what I call lashing mode. And by that, I don't just mean lashing out against Vigano. I mean in the sense uh, of, a, of a ship at sea where the crew wants to lash itself to the mast to ride out the storm. I think they're now in that mode of lashing themselves to the mast and riding out the storm no matter what. Um, so um, I think we, we see in the modernist agenda that they have this confidence because all of their fellow leftists and liberals, liberals are those, as you saw from an earlier video, uh, talking about Dr. Felix Salva Isadani's work, Liberalism is a Sin, wants to detach human life, especially public life, from any obligation to follow God's law. That the liberals, whatever they call themselves, whether they call themselves leftists or progressives or modernists, they're all liberals in the sense that Dr. Sarda Isalvani describes them as those who want to basically exalt the dignity of man above any obligation that human beings have to their creator and to their redeemer. That the dignity of man enable, basically enables man to be totally independent of God, to function independently of God and despite God, in spite of God, literally in spite of God. This is what liberalism does. That the modernists look to all their fellow liberals and they say, we're all in this together. We're all going to watch each other's back. We are all about promoting now this liberalism, which gives, us, gives rise to the modernist morality of turning loose the homosexuals in the church, and as I say, turning it into a gigantic homosexual playground. And so I think they have this confidence that as long as we can still pass this off as a homosexual problem, at the same time we're legitimizing homosexuality, we are going to basically thwart any effort to dethrone us in the Vatican or anywhere else. Now, uh, I could, again, get into the whole question of the left and the right and so on, but I don't want to get into that right now because I want to close by referring to something that happened just after Vatican II came to an end. As you know, Vatican II was closed in December of 1965. 
And within the year, the renewal was already well underway. And part of that renewal involved psychological, psychological renewal within the religious congregations of the church here in this country. I'm referring now to a document that is contained in the EWTN library. Okay? EWTN has this document. It actually uh, concerns a very, very well-known case which unfortunately many of you might have missed. It's the case of Dr. Coulson. Dr. Coulson, C-O-U-L-S-O-N, William Coulson, a disciple of the American psychologist Carl Rogers. As a matter of fact, allow me to read the introduction here within this, this uh, statement, uh, this, this uh, statement contained within the EWTN library uh, as an, a, an interview with Dr. Coulson. It's entitled, We Overcame Their Traditions, We Overcame Their Faith. And uh, the interview begins with this introduction. A contrite Catholic psychologist's disturbing testimony about his central role in the destruction of religious orders. <clears throat> Dr. William Coulson was a disciple of the influential American psychologist Carl Rogers. <clears throat> and for many years, a co-practitioner of the latter's non-directive therapy. In 1964, he became chief of staff at Rogers Western Behavioral Sciences Institute in La Jolla, California, where he says, as the resident Catholic, it became his task to gather a cadre of felicitators to invade the Immaculate Heart of Mary community of nuns, and later, some two dozen other orders, among them, the Sisters of Mercy, the Sisters of Providence, <clears throat> and the Jesuits. <clears throat> it was only in 1971 that he began to back away from religious orders, back away, rather, from his belief in psychotherapy, when its destructive effects on the religious orders and on the church and society in general became apparent to him. Having abandoned his once lucrative practice, Dr. Coulson now devotes his life to lecturing to Catholic and Protestant groups on the dangers of psychotherapy. <clears throat> it, it continues in the next paragraph, in the following interview with Dr. William Mara, God rest his soul, Dr. Coulson discusses his role in the destruction of Catholic religious orders and his subsequent change of mind. Now, for those of you who want to get on the WTM website, website and find in their library this document, you'll find it very much worth reading. Very, very instructive and revealing. <clears throat> I'm just going to try to paraphrase it and perhaps uh, quote some of the uh, areas where uh, quotations are in order to show you what's really happened. Uh, Dr. Coulson um, says that he went to Notre Dame. He got his he was working on his doctorate in philosophy at Notre Dame. His dissertation was on Carl Rogers' theory of human nature. He says that that theory of human nature believed that every man is totally good. At this point, Dr. Maris stopped him and st said, stop right there. Were you a Catholic at the time? And Coulson answers, yes. And Dr. Maris said, and Notre Dame was still Catholic, was Catholic. Interesting question. And Notre Dame was Catholic at the time. And uh, Dr. Coulson answers, Notre Dame was Catholic, was Catholic, he says. I got a good education in Thomistic philosophy. And doc uh, Dr. Mara asks him, well, didn't it occur to you that as a faithful Catholic, you couldn't buy the idea that men are basically good didn't original sin mean anything to you? And Coulson responds that it wasn't my task then to be a critic of Rogers' theory. I wanted to find out what he taught. And having read everything that I could get my hands on, I contacted him at the University of Wisconsin. <clears throat> so again, a sad answer, but he's being very frank. 
Yes, Dr. Uh, Rogers' uh, theory and his philosophy was against, his psychology was against Catholic teaching, but he, as a, a in the doctoral program at U the University of Notre Dame, was going to write his dissertation on this, this whole idea, in a sense glorifying what he knew was contrary to the faith. I guess he didn't appreciate it at the time, as he explains a bit later. In any case, uh, Dr. Um, Coulson did, as this doctoral candidate, contact Rogers at the University of Wisconsin and was invited to go there and work with Dr. Coulson. And uh, Dr., uh, Dr. Rogers, rather. Rogers was working with neurotics. He was working with neuroses through his method of non-directive therapy. And uh, in the course of the inter interview, Coulson says, so Rogers had the idea that to help these neurotics, we should refer them to the source of authority within them. In other words, refer them to their consciences. Now here you, you see where this is leading here. Their consciences is the ultimate authority. This is the Novus Ordo. This is modernism. Anyway, Rogers says the, the way to treat these neuroses, he was using non-directive therapy, was not to direct them to any higher law than themselves, but get them to pay attention only to their consciences as the ultimate authority. And uh, the interview continued. I'm skipping over quite a bit here in the interest of time. Coulson, later on in the interview, said, It works, you know. One tumbles pretty easily into this. We corrupted a whole raft of religious orders on the West Coast in the 1960s by getting the nuns and the priests to talk about their distress. In other words, getting them to look inward, to be totally focused inward on themselves. Not only as to what the problem is, but the solution too. That will appear as I read further. Coulson says, I joined Rogers in his study of non-directive psychotherapy with normal people. So they were going to try this therapy now for normal people. He explains that this is what Vatican II seemed to call for, renewal of the religious orders. They thought that they would try this, this whole psychotherapy thing, by going to the religious orders and helping them renew. He says, we had the idea that if it was good for neurotics, it would be good for normals. <clears throat> well, the normal people of Wisconsin proved how normal they were by opting out. As soon as they knew what it was, we wanted. Nobody wanted any part of it. So we went to California. I guess they figured they wouldn't find normals out there, but they said they would find them in the religious congregations of the church. And so Coulson says, I knew you were going to say this, that was my first mistake looking for normal people in California, he says. No offense, I know a lot of normal, very good people in California. But we found the Sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the IHMs. They agreed to let us come into their schools and work with their normal faculty and with their normal students and influenced the developments of normal Catholic family life. It was a disaster, Coulson says. And uh, so then Mara asks him, well, wh when are we talking about? We're talking about 1966 and 1967. Remember, I mentioned Vatican II ended in December of 1965. So already, already they were pursuing this in 1966 and 1967, in the immediate aftermath of Vatican II. And then, uh, if you have little children listening, don't let them listen to this. This is one reason why it's so hard to deal with this topic in anything that is a family program because it is so sordid. Coulson begins then to talk about what they were doing in 1966 to 1967 and its consequences. With the nuns, he says, there's a tragic book called Lesbian Nuns, Breaking Silence, which documents part of our effect on the Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters and other orders that engaged in similar experiments in what we called sensitivity or encounter. In a chapter of lesbian nuns, one former Immaculate Heart nun describes the summer of 1966 
when we did the pilot study in her order. We, Mara asks, being you and Rogers. And he says, yes, Rogers and I. And eventually 58 other psychologists who began working with them on these nuns. We had 60 facilitators, he says. We inundated that system with humanistic psychology. We called it therapy for normals, TFN. The Immaculate Heart of Mary Sisters had some 60 schools when we started. At the end, they had one. There were some 615 nuns when we began. Within a year, after our first interventions, 300 of them were petitioning Rome to get out of their vows. They did not want to be under anyone's authority except the authority of their imperial inner selves. At this point, actually, it, it appears that they had a copy of this book, Lesbian Nuns, at hand because Dr. Mara asks, who is that on the cover of the book? Well, as a matter of fact, someone provided for me years ago a copy of this book. I don't recommend it. It is sordid. It is gravely immoral. But it is an eye-opener to show what they did to these sisters in the name of renewal of Vatican II. Coulson answers that on the cover of that book, Lesbian Nuns Breaking Silence, is Sister Mary Benjamin, IHM. He says, Sister Mary Benjamin got involved with us in the summer of 1966 and became the victim of a lesbian seduction. An older nun in the group, feeling herself to be more expressive of who she really was internally, decided that she wanted to make love with Sister Mary Benjamin. Well, Sister Mary Benjamin engaged in this, and then she was stricken with guilt and wondered, to quote from her book, was I doing something wrong? Was I doing something terrible? I talked to a priest. Unfortunately, Coulson says, we had talked to him first. I talked to a priest, she said, who refused to pass judgment on my actions. He said it was up to me to decide if they were right or wrong. He opened a door, and I walked through the door, realizing I was on my own. Isn't that interesting? He refused to pass judgment on my actions, essentially saying, 50 years ago, who am I to judge? What became of Sister Mary Benjamin? He said, this is her liberation. Now her parents had not delivered her to the Immaculate Heart of Mary Sisters in order for her to be on her own. She was precious to them. She describes the day in 1962 when they drove her in the station wagon to Montecito to the Immaculate Heart of Mary Novitiate, how excited they were to be delivering someone into God's hands. Well, instead, they delivered her into the hands of non-directive psychology. And this is what has become of Sister Mary Benjamin now. She embraced the life of lesbianism, homosexuality. It is who she has become. And she then oversaw the publication of this book, Lesbian Nuns, Breaking Silence. You see, this happened, we're talking about the 1966-1967 aftermath of Vatican II. We're talking about the years immediately after Vatican II. What was done in the name of renewal. And that is what uh, Coulson says in the course of his interview. He says uh, that he and Rogers had access, not only because he was Catholic, but because he said Rogers himself had a, had a great reputation. He said he was a former president of the American Psychology, Psychological Association. He won his first Distinguished Scientific Contribution Award. Uh, the WBSI was also the home of Abraham Maslow, the other great figure in humanistic psychology. 
And he says this is what entered by means of, of their influence into these religious communities, humanistic psychology in the name of renewal after Vatican II. Coulson, Coulson addresses that question, what does it mean to you? What the priest said to Sister Mary Benjamin, what does it mean to you? Or what does it mean to me? Or to God? The priest got confused, he said, about his role as a confessor. He thought it was personal, and he consulted himself and said, I can't pass judgment on you. But that's not what confession is, Coulson says. It is not about the priest as a person taking a decision for the client. Rather, it's what God says. In fact, God has already judged in this matter. God has judged. You are quite right to feel guilty about it. Go thou and sin no more. Instead, he said to Sister Mary Benjamin that she should decide for herself. And that's exactly what she did. And so Colson continues, as I said, the Immaculate Heart of Marys were pretty progressive, but some of the leadership was a little bit nervous about the secular psychologist from La Jolla coming in. And so I met with the whole community. Some 600 nuns gathered in the Immaculate Heart High School Gymnasium in Hollywood on April, on an, an April day in 1967. We've already done the pilot study. We told them, now we want to get everybody in the system involved in non-directive self-exploration. We call it encounter groups. But if that name doesn't please you, we'll call it something else. We'll call it the person group. So they went along with us and they trusted us. And they basically put the entire congregation of 600 nuns in the hands of these psychologists, to be instructed by them, to be formed by them, to be reformed by them, and really to be deformed by them. He says, this was all anti-Catholic, but I didn't realize it at the time. I didn't recognize it because I probably was myself, he says. We both had a bias against hierarchy. I was flush with Vatican II, he says. I was flush with Vatican II, and I thought, I am the church. I am as Catholic as the Pope. Didn't Pope John XXIII want us to open the windows and let in the fresh air? Here we come. And we did. And within a year, those nuns wanted out of their vows. Curious that he re reflects on that, that motivation, that he was full of Vatican II, that John XXIII wanted to let in the fresh air. Where was he going to let that fresh air in? Was he going to let it in from the world? He said the air in the church would become stale. So he's going to open the windows and let in the fresh air. He was going to let the fresh air in from the socialists, his buddies in France, from the leftists, his buddies who he socialized with in France as Apostolic Nuncio. He was going to let the fresh in from the air come in from the world. And it's strange that he used that expression. That John the Twenty Third proposed letting the fresh air come into the church, and John, and rather Paul the Sixth, having changed the mass and all the sacraments and brought in the Novus Ordo, says the smoke of Satan now has filled the sanctuary of God. Is there a connection between these two? You bet there is. You bet there is. That smoke of Satan is the Novus Ordo. That's a new order. That's the fresh air that John the Twenty Third led into the church, and you smell it. You can smell it now in the abuse of children, but you'll be smelling it here in a minute when they tell you, when they tell you what they did to these good sisters and these young people who gathered there to pursue their vocations in the service of God and what became of them. He says, Rogers and I did a tape for Bell and Howell summarizing that project, and I talked about some of the short-term effects and said that when people do what they deeply want to do, it isn't immoral. Well, we hadn't waited long enough. The lesbian nuns book, for example, hadn't come out yet, and we hadn't gotten the reports of seductions in psychotherapy. We think about the seductions going on now. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't have to wait for Francis. It's going on already. 
within months of Vatican II, as soon as they turned loose this renewal of psychotherapy on the, on the religious sisters of California, the seductions began right away. It's modernism. It was modernism from the beginning. He says we hadn't gotten the reports yet of the seductions in psychotherapy, which became virtually routine in California. I'm not talking about 2018. I'm not talking about 2017, 2016. I'm talking about 1966 and 1967. They knew where this was going. They knew very well where it was going. We had trained people who didn't have Roger's innate discipline for his own fundamentalist Protestant background. People thought that being themselves, that's the message of non-directive therapy, that being themselves meant unleashing libido. This is what they understood it to mean. Letting go all their passions. And so Colson continues later. Actually, he's responding to a question here that Mara asked him. But once you had those 600 nuns broken down into their encounter groups, how long did it take for the damage to set in? Coulson responds, Well, in the summer of 67, the Immaculate Heart of Marys were having their chapter. They had been called, as all religious orders were, to reevaluate their mode of living and to bring it more in line with the charisms of their founder. So they were ready for us. They were ready for an intensive look at themselves with the help of humanistic psychologists. We overcame their traditions. We overcame their faith. Bud Kaiser, Father Elwood Kaiser, a Paulist priest, producer of Insight, I think you may know him. He wrote a book last year called Hollywood Priests. He's got a chapter in there about his romantic involvement with one of our nuns. One of our sisters of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, Father Kaiser explains that as Genevieve, as he calls her, got in the spirit of Rogerian non-directive encounter, she propositioned him sexually. He refused her because he didn't see how he could have something going on with her and still be a good priest. But she got sexually involved with her Rogerian therapist. We were referring nuns who opened up too much in our encounter groups to therapists who are on the periphery. And this is what happened to them. They became intimately involved with them. And uh, Mara asks, marvelous indeed, how many years did it take to destroy this Immaculate Heart of Mary order? Colson said it took about a year and a half. A year and a half. Vatican II itself was spread over three years. And one and a half years of applying these ideas of conscience above all, look to your inner self for your ultimate guide, destroyed an entire religious congregation. Inconceivable. Mara asks, of the 615, how many are left? Coulson answers, there are the retired nuns who are living in the mother house in Hollywood. There is a small group of radical feminists who run a center for feminist theology in a storefront in Hollywood. He says, the order as a whole, the Immaculate Heart of Mary, which conducted all those schools, there are a few of them in Wichita, whom I visited recently, Coulson says, who are going to make a go of it as a traditional teaching, as traditional teaching nuns. There are a few doing the same thing in Beverly Hills, and there may be a couple or a dozen left altogether apart from whom, and he says, kaput, they're gone. Amazing, huh? The destruction, the devastation. Amazing. No wonder St. Pius X told one of his cardinals back in the in 1910 or so, that the modernists would return and lay waste the church 50 years later, because that's exactly what they did. What did they do? Coulson says, our grant had been for three years, <clears throat> but we called off the study after two, because we were alarmed about the results. It took them one and a half years only to destroy that congregation. 
We thought we could make the Immaculate Heart of Mary sisters better than they were, and we destroyed them. And Coulson says, we did similar programs for the Jesuits, for the Franciscans, for the Sisters of Providence, of Charity, and the Mercy Sisters. We did dozens of Catholic religious organizations because, as you recall, in the excitement following Vatican II, everybody wanted to update. Everybody wanted to renew. And we offered a way for people to renew without having to bother to study. We said, we'll help you look within. After all, is not God in your heart? Is not sufficient? Is it not sufficient to be yourself? And wouldn't that make you a good Catholic? The same old slogans, the same old buzzwords that have been circulating ever since with the modernists, with the liberals, within their modernist religion of Vatican II, same old wisdom, which is the foolishness of men in the, in the Church of God. Is it not sufficient to be yourself? And wouldn't that be, make you a good Catholic all by itself? And if it doesn't, then perhaps you shouldn't have been a Catholic in the first place. Well, after a while, there weren't many Catholics left, he says. This interview with Dr. Coulson is very, very, very important to read it in the context of today now, to read it in the context of what was written by Archbishop Vigano, written in the context of Francis and his refusal to answer, even in, re in terms of his statement, who am I to judge? I'm going to close very soon. I'm sorry for going on at some length here, but I think it is instructive to us to understand what's happening before our very eyes here and why I say the problem is modernism. Ultimately, that is what has unleashed this in the church. Coulson says, my phoniness, he refers to his phoniness. But what is phoniness? Well, his phoniness is, among other things, his Catholic doctrine. This is what we make people think is phony, the Catholic doctrine that he's learned. That when we get a person to turn inside himself and review, then what looks as though it's something imported, not something of himself, something that has been imposed from outside him, something that is phony is his Catholic faith, he says. If you look within yourself and you find the creed, for example, you can imagine someone saying, oh, you're just being a mama's boy, aren't you? You're just doing what you were taught to do. I want to hear from the real you. The proof of authenticity on the humanistic philosophy model is to go against what you were trained to do, what you were trained to be, to call all of that phoniness and to say what is deepest within you What's deepest within you, however, are certain unrequited longings, including sexual longings. We provoked an epidemic of sexual misconduct among clergy and therapists. We're talking about the immediate aftermath of Vatican II. It's been going on all that time. No surprise. Francis says, the spirit of surprises is his God. But this should come as no surprise. They knew exactly what they were doing all the time. From that moment that Coulson and Rogers descended upon the religious, the Catholic religious congregations of, of uh, California, they knew exactly what to expect with their modern, modernism, and that's exactly what they got all the way through. Remember, the report of the grand jury in Pennsylvania covered 70 years abuse cases going back 70 years in the run-up during and after Vatican II. <clears throat> and Coulson continues, well, actually, we started with the Jesuits. He said, we actually started with the Jesuits. <clears throat> we did our first Jesuit workshop in 1965, he says, even before Vatican II had ended. In 1965, John uh, Rogers got two honorary doctorates from the Jesuit universities. They thought we were saviors. And he says that what they did was revamp the Jesuit training, the training process. 
he says, we, we really messed up the training process for the Jesuits. They saw that happen before their very eyes. He says, there's actually a book on the subject, a book written by a Jesuit. And um, the title of the book is The Reformed Jesuits. It reviews the collapse of the Jesuit training program between 1965 and 1975. The Jesuit formation virtually fell apart, he says, during that time. He says, it was Rogerian. It was there. follow your conscience, search inside, do your own thing mentality. He says, we taught people that they could trust their evil impulses, that they really weren't evil because they were theirs and they were genuine and all was good. But they really were evil. These are the words of Coulson. But they were really evil, he says now. This hit home again and again for Rogers in the 1970s, when rumors began to circulate about a group that had spun off from ours. And he talks about the groups that they had spun off and doing their own research, involving, of all people, Jesuits. He says, by then, we had become the center for studies of the person in La Jolla having spun off from what he calls the WBSI. And at the same time, there spun off another group called the Center for Feeling Therapy in Hollywood. <clears throat> well, charges were brought against the guys at the Center for Feeling Therapy, one of three founders of what that, by the way, being a Jesuit who had left the order, and among the things that the state of California was perceptive enough to charge them with was killing babies, 11 times women, who became pregnant while they were in the compound, the Center for Feeling Therapy, were forced, to, forced, he says, to abort their babies. The state of California charged them with this crime. Mara asked, was this before Roe versus Wade? Remember the legalization of abortion nationwide? No, Coulson said, this happened after Roe versus Wade. Roe versus Wade was in 1973, remember. But the state medical board held that it was unethical for those men to force the women to have abortions because those women wanted their babies. And uh, again, Colson says, this is one of the spin-offs of their own doings here. And a Jesuit, one of the three founders of this criminal enterprise. Colson continues, humanistic psychotherapy, the kind that has virtually taken over the church in America. I'm going to repeat his words here. Humanistic psychotherapy, the kind that has virtually taken over the church in America and dominates so many forms of aberrant education, like sex education and drug education, holds that the most important source of authority is within you, that you must listen to yourself well. Again, he's going right to the root of this. He's going to the root of this whole problem. People have to listen to him, listen to what he's saying. It goes back to the modernism unleashed on the church by Vatican II. Coulson Evers goes on to say that he pulled his own children out of Catholic schools while all of this was going on, while they were corrupting the religious congregations teaching in other Catholic schools and corrupting other Catholic schools. He and his wife, he attributes his wife's perceptiveness to this, pulled their own children out of those Catholic schools because he recognized what was going on. Now, my dear people, how can we continue to be in denial? How can we continue to deny that it is modernists who have done this? They are the sworn enemies of the Catholic Church, unveiled as the worst enemies the Church has ever faced by Pope St. Pius X himself in 1907, encyclical Pascendi. In that encyclical, Pope St. Pius X said that modernism is the, is the collection of all the heresies. It changes the very meaning of the word faith, for heaven's sake. And he says that modernists are characterized by pride and audacity. But you can't find anything more audacious than Francis's answer to those journalists. That is characteristic of audacity. And it is also audacious for a man like Francis to say, who am I to judge? when God has already judged, when God has already made the judgment. 
Now it's a matter of what Francis is willing to judge. He can disregard God's judgment. He can even override God's judgment. He can overrule the judgment of the church with regard to capital punishment. Why? Because he's the Francis. And everything he says is magisterium. This is modernism. This is not Catholicism. And what has done this is not the Catholic Church. It is the enemy of the Catholic Church, the modernist church that has come out of Vatican II. We need to understand that so that we cannot blame the church or Christ for what has happened. We need rather to rescue the church from the clutches of these modernist maniacs. We need to rescue the church from the clutches of these people. And we need to insist that they do not legitimately represent the Catholic faith. They do not legitimately represent the Catholic Church. That their religion is a religion of modernism. It is the practice of modernism, which they and we now know as the Novus Ordo. We have to put an end to the charade that they've got going on, which has for the last 70 years, as it was found, produced these, these predators, these homosexual predators who are preying upon their own children, in their own seminaries, and in their own schools. My dear people, please, please see reality for what it is. Don't continue under the, into the modernist fog, wandering, stumbling through the modernist fog that they generate, the smoke of Satan. Realize that this is modernism that has done this. The enemy of Christ, the enemy of the church, the enemy of Catholics has done this evil deed. And it's going to continue doing this as long as they can get away with it. And they will get away with it as long, until somebody recognizes, until we recognize what the problem is. The problem, ultimately, is modernism that has invaded the church. That is the smoke of Satan. And now we have to blow it out. And we have to return to practice the traditional Catholic religion, the only real expression of the true Catholic faith. May God bless you all.